Hello, welcome back to Talk TV with me, David Bull. Thank you very much indeed for your company. The time, just 25 minutes past seven on Saturday, September uh, the 24th. Thank you very much indeed for all your messages that are coming in. Lots and lots of those about the fiscal budget. Uh, David, uh, lots, of, lots of them about something else. Uh, like this one, for example. Jackie, good morning, Jackie. Uh, David, uh, looking so smart this morning, your shirt is fabulous. So thank you very much indeed, Jackie, for that. That's made my morning. Good morning, David, says Chris. Um, Labour, before the fiscal event, said new taxes, highest for 70 years, and then afterwards Labour said, shouldn't be cutting taxes, windfall tax, blah, blah, blah. Windfall tax, not a long-term policy. It's a gotcha soundbite. They don't have a clue. Michael, uh, good morning to you. Michael says, uh, does the government actually care what's really happening to Britain? It's going down the swanee. It's sinking under the weight of illegal immigration whilst uh, Kwasi Kwarteng tinkers around the edges with borrowed money. I don't think it's tinkering around the edges. I think it's dramatic open heart surgery, actually. Uh, Tony says Paul Johnson from the IFS reports that taxes will rise or spending will be cut. Finan the financial markets are not impressed by Liz Truss. That's very true, actually. The... Um we, we saw the rate, uh, the pound against the dollar, fall to a, a new uh, low as a result of that. But that doesn't mean everything. I think uh, we need to just give it some time and let that settle in. As I said, it is actually a very difficult budget to get your head around and to work out exactly uh, who is helped by that and whether it is truly economic and whether it is political. Let me know your thoughts. 0344 499 1000. Text the word talk and your message to 87222 and tweet us at talk TV. Well, it's time now for our next newspaper review. Joining us this morning is Dawn Maria France. She's editor-in-chief of Yorkshire Women's Life. Good morning. Good morning. Anne. Lovely to see you again. And to see you. Thank you for having me again. Oh, no, not at all. It's lovely. Thank you for uh, coming down from Yorkshire. So, uh, you <laughs> you really picked a day to, to go through the papers, I didn't certainly you? have. You're yes. Kidding. So, your first paper is the Daily Mail. What What's that all about? So, the Daily Mail splash, of course, is about the budget. That's the only story in town. Um, it's a bit of a marmite budget, to be fair. Um, there's some things that I find encouraging. For example, no stamp duty on the first £250,000. A property doubled from £125,000 originally. And the Treasury said that means that 200,000 more people a year will be able to buy houses. Mm. And in Yorkshire, the rents are so high. So this is encouraging news, so I'm happy with that. But, but it is encouraging news, but, but again, the elephant in the room is we need to build some houses. We do. But I did read recently that Liz Trust was looking into actually um, relaxing the planning laws. Indeed. So we just need to see what happens there. I'm also encouraged by the national insurance rate, which will be cut from November. The 1.25% um, point, which was um, a rise that we saw earlier. Um, that will um, be reversed on the 6th of November, and that will help 28 million working people. So I'm encouraged by that kind yeah, of Do you know how story. much that's costing, by the way? £18 billion pounds to do that. I mean, it's a heck of a lot of money. I mean, in, I mean, it, you know, where, however you look at this, it really is extraordinary. £26 billion pounds of tax cuts and £18 billion of tax rises cancelled. That comes to £45 billion. Pounds. That is a lot of money. Well, if you think that this has actually been done... Um, in order to generate 2.5% growth, a growth level that we haven't seen since, you know, God was a boy, um, <laughs> you know, one would hope that this kind of fiscal investment of our money, because let's not be, you know, churlish about this, there is no government money, this is taxpayers' money, so one has to hope that that rather large growth forecast will be hit because of this. Yeah. And if it is... Then we'll be laughing. Well, that's right. Sorry, sorry. Do carry on, though. No, uh, it's a huge gamble. That, um, Do you well, think it's a gamble? I think it's a gamble between um, Liz Truss and Kwasi Kwarteng. We really need to look at growth because growth will help the economy and they've taken this huge gamble with this budget. But be before, when um, Liz was on the leadership trail, she did talk about a mini-budget. But it's for her to win or lose the next election because it's a lot of borrowing. It won't sit well with um, Tory supporters, so we need to see this work. 
But I'll tell you what I was interested in as well, yeah. um, which came out of the um, budget, was the universal credit rules. And they're changing on low incomes. So from next year, more than 100,000 people that are claiming universal credit, they'll be asked to take active steps. I don't know what active steps mm, mean, yes. actually. That might be some kind of code. Um, so they've been asked to either increase their hours at work or find better paid jobs or have their benefit reduced. So is this the return to the nasty party? And how do you prove that? Do you need to then go into the job centre and prove that you've applied for these jobs, but assume, you didn't get it? I would assume you would have to have documented evidence as to what you've actually done. I mean, it's a really good point. Um, and, and is it? And what, what's your view on that? I think that um, it needs to be more steak and less carrot. You, you need to encourage people to actually look for work, but by threatening them in this way. Mm. I mean, the Department of Work and Pension doesn't always have the best, <laughs> best <laughs> reputation. It's always in the news. Nice. <laughs> yeah, I'm being very <laughs> diplomatic. You, you are, you are. Well, I think what this is set to overcome, and I think it is a problem, is I know plenty of people who work at minimum wage, and that's probably the first problem, for 16 hours a week, and they will not work a second over 16 hours because at 16 hours they get council tax rebates, they get rent paid, they get prescriptions, all sorts of things, and they don't fall into the tax bracket because they're on minimum wage. So they don't pay any tax, but they are taking out lots of benefits. But for them, they can't move outside of that because they're earning so little because of low wages that they then lose the benefits that are helping them survive. Well, that's ridiculous. So, yes, but we need to look at these bottom jobs and say to employers, you need to pay more. Yeah. It needs to not be you and I, and you know, paying tax. We need to look at employers and say, look, to pay more. Mm -hmm. I mean, the thing that I was never comfortable with was when Gordon Brown brought in working tax credit because, for me, um, he gave employers the chance to give low wage yeah. and for people to get it topped up. And so what it did was it depressed the wage growth, in my opinion, and that, I think, was a mistake mm -hmm. and not a policy that I welcomed at the time. No, sure. So just just in terms of, and I said this earlier, in terms of the papers this morning, they're a very mixed bag. You know, the fact is, the Daily Mail is saying at last a true Tory budget. Uh, the I saying the pound, pound has plummeted after Kwarteng bets the UK economy on tax cuts. It's almost as though we're reading very different stories, isn't it? The way it's portrayed in different national newspapers. Well, this is true. I mean, the, the, um, the Guardian have said that it's a, a budget for the rich. And then when you look at the Chancellor, he's announced more than 400 billion of extra borrowing over the next couple of years. So it does look, it, like I said, it is a bit of a Marmite budget, really. There is some good news there, but there's also a long way that he could have gone as well. And, and tell me, so, so in, under the previous government, it was all about levelling up. How will this budget be perceived in Yorkshire, do you think? I think um, the good news with the stamp duty, because the rents in Yorkshire yeah. are quite high, um, a lot of people, most of their wage is paying the rents for their property. Property. So that would be good with the stamp duty. It will encourage more people to look at perhaps buying a house. Um, and as I said, I'm encouraged by the national insurance as well, because if you've got more money um, coming into your household, then you're going to spend more into the economy. So I'm, I'm happy with that as well. And what about pensioners? I think that pensioners have been forgotten as they well, have, because um, they're on a fixed income. I've not seen any kind of support mechanism there, and I'm sad by that, mm. because they've paid into the system all their lives, and they should have been actually built into this budget. <laughs> so the conversations that I've had with people in Yorkshire is that the the pensioners seem to be forgotten in the mini well, budget and they've, they've lost an opportunity to do something there. Well, certainly on Talk TV yesterday, I heard so many calls and messages from pensioners saying uh, they, they literally can't afford to live. They had something like £1.50 uh, to, to spend on food for the rest of the week. I mean, we can't live in a country where that, that happens. And also, we, we, we seem to have this view of pensioners that they have loads of money, they're sitting in big houses, and actually they, they are just sort of a drain on society. Society is here because of pensioners, yeah, because they've worked, point. they've paid tax, yeah. they've had children, yeah, and point. they've forwarded society. Yeah, but here's the other problem. A lot of pensioners are in houses they shouldn't really be in, but they can't afford to move because it's too expensive to move, and, they, and they're and they trapped, and they're not being given enough help either. They are trapped, but I also, I also worry.
worry about that, David, because I worry about these calls that say, oh, well, all those pensioners in three-bedroom houses. I don't want to usurp a granny in a three-bedroom no, house. No, I don't. If that's where she lived with her husband for 60 years and it's got I all know. of her memories. So I, I don't think you. we should be talking like that. I agree. I, I don't like the argument where you pit young people against yeah. the older. I'm not really comfortable with that. You've got to realise that not all pensioners so, so are rich. So let me rich. just ask you, though, and I did ask this um, question earlier, how much of this is about the, the bold e economics of this saying, actually, we're going to take a gamble, this is going to get us out of this mess, and how much of this is political talking to the Tories? I think a lot of it, it might be 50-50 of actually we're going to get out of this mess and then trying to play to um, the audience really because they've got to try and win the Tories over but with the borrowing I don't think that would actually sit well with a lot of Tories. They need to get, God, they need to push for growth. That's what they need to do. And as I said earlier, it's for Liz to win or lose the next election. This has to work. This gamble has to work. You're not kidding. She's, She's saying she, that's probably her mantra as she goes to sleep. This has to work. This has to work. <laughs> um, so let's move now to the Daily Telegraph. This is a really stunning front page, actually. Oh, I really like this. Um, although it's bittersweet because obviously we've just come out of mourning for our beloved Queen. So this is the first official photograph of the King and it shows him attending to his red boxes in his new office in Buckingham Palace. Um, and it's an image that presents him as the working monarch. Um, and also the photograph of the King was issued by Buckingham Palace and it was two uh, it was two weeks and two days after we lost our great queen and it's, it follows in the tradition of having these images so it's just I quite like this story, but it, is, it comes with a bittersweet taste as well. Yeah, of course. Let's hope he's not signed a Netflix deal. Do you think he has? No. I mean, <laughs> I have to say, uh, we spoke about this, and obviously the coverage we did here on Talk TV over uh, the very sad death of, of uh, Queen Elizabeth and then, of course, the mourning that then took place. I think King Charles III has done a tremendous job. Yes. The, 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 um, the, the pomp and pageantry and ceremony was incredible, but also the way the crowd has transferred seamlessly to him. He's been in waiting for this, hasn't he, for a very long time. And actually, it's pictures like that, I think, that tell a great story. This is about the continuity of the monarchy. Yes. He is doing exactly what his mother did. This is about duty. She did her red boxes every single day apart from Christmas Day. She did. Yes. That's absolutely No, true. I absolutely agree with you, and I think he handled it really, really well. I think he did things that put people at ease. People were nervous about King Charles III, Mm. And I think the way that he handled himself and connected with people over the last two weeks put people at ease, which is a good thing. All we need to make sure now is that he doesn't bend Liz Truss's ear about the climate forever. But, he, but he's else. been very clear, saying, I will step back from that, hasn't he? He said, I am now the monarch. I can't be the Prince of Wales. The Prince of Wales, however, can yeah. be the Prince of Wales. He can, though, because he does have a private audience with the Prime Minister well, of the week, which we never know what no. is well, discussed. Very, very very true. True. OK, let's move on to the day. Daily Express now. Um, this is on page eight, isn't it? Yeah, this one um, is about job hunt aids for the over 50s. And even if people don't agree that age discrimination does or doesn't exist, I believe it does exist. No, I do. Yeah. So, um, so this is to give um, people that are over 50s additional support. So when they go to um, the job centres, they'll be seen by job coaches and be encouraged and supported into work. But I'll tell you what I didn't know. I didn't know that 18% um, that of people aged 50 to 70 were left without jobs yeah. during the pandemic. Yeah. That was a surprise to me. Mm. I mean, it's yeah. very difficult, I think. If you've lost your job as a 50-year-old and you're trying to go back into the workforce, there are a lot of issues at play, not least your own psychology, how you feel about that, your own self-worth, must be very difficult. Yeah, I said this at the beginning of the pandemic, that the people that were going to suffer here were the children and then the older people. Because if you lose your job over 50, not only are you up against a much younger cohort when it comes to getting a job, but you're more expensive generally. Because you have a standard of living, you have a mortgage to pay, you have rent to pay, you know, you have a certain 
certain amount that you need to earn. You also have maybe not the same transferable skills that younger people have for today's modern jobs. So it's a big problem. And discrimination does exist for all of those reasons. And also, you know, people think that an older person isn't going to work so long, is going to be slower, isn't going to be as, you know, up to date. And we have to overcome those, not just by training the 50-year-olds, but by training the employers. Well, well, I agree with that. And when I ran a company, or a, a relatively big company, we found that with the older members of staff, those over 50, they provided very different skills. They were very good at critical thinking, helping younger people not be rash, making those rash uh, judgments that they do. Also, they've been around the block, haven't they? So they can say, I've seen this before. It might not be a good idea. They have much to offer. Yeah, I agree. Totally. Right, let's move on to the times now. Page six. So page six um, is about a 100-year-old former steel worker, my part of the world. She's from Sheffield. And so she worked in the steelworks in the Second World War, and she's been awarded an honorary degree in engineering by Sheffield University. <laughs> so um, this has been awarded to Job Kathleen. Of the week. Yeah, this has been <laughs> awarded to Kathleen Roberts, who at 16 she was called to work in the steelworks, like so many women at the time, while the men went off um, to fight. Mm. So for her to get her honorary degree at 100 years old, yeah, amazing. Like, we need a good news story. That's in all, in all the chaos that we're living in. Because not not forgetting that what followed then is that when all the men came back from war, mm. all the women lost their jobs or had to give up their jobs when they got married. Yeah. yeah. It was a different time, was it not? I mean, it does show how the world's moved on. Though. Can you imagine? No, I I'd never get married. <laughs> <laughs> That's also very true. And then you've got one more, have you? You've got the sun. Yes. Um, so this is um, sad news for Kent and Sussex. Um, they're supposed to be flooding over the weekend um, when there's been three inches of rain suspected to fall really and so um, businesses are trying to manage that situation of the heavy rain and the Met Office have issued a yellow weather warning as well so it's not good news for that part of the world really and yet you see the extraordinary thing is I I read something from Thames Water yesterday saying that the hosepipe ban is still in place because of course reservoirs are so low because Mm. of course we didn't get any rain Mm -hmm. and actually looking at my grass it's all yellow because we haven't had any rain and of course it does beg the question about our infrastructure why are we building on floodplains why haven't we uh, upgraded the infrastructure why are poor families still in this situation of worrying about whether their house will be flooded yes absolutely i agree why are we not dredging rivers why are we not putting into the farming fields around kent and that's half of the problem you know the necessary runoffs and everything else that's needed i mean we do like talking about the weather in this country but it does seem if feast or famine there's no rain then there's lots of rain Mm -hmm. doesn't it um i mean as you said we should actually be looking at dredging the rivers we need to look at stop building on floodplains Mm -hmm. and some of the houses on floodplains are some of the cheapest houses for the poorest people yeah well what i'm what what i'm hopeful in this budget and possibly with the new government is if they relax the planning laws then maybe we can actually get some houses built in the right place at the right price for people who really need it and those are those first-time buyers and stop building in the wrong places on floodplains where all we will ever get is problems. And we also need to look at essential workers who cannot actually live in the centre of of London and have to live on the outskirts and we need those essential workers to have affordable homes. And indeed in cities in Yorkshire for example, you know, across the United Kingdom, um, houses are expensive and we need to provide for essential key workers. We do, definitely. Yeah. Thank you very much indeed for coming in, Dawn Maria France, Editor-in-Chief of Yorkshire Women's Life. Right, after the break, it's time for our sporting roundup with Mr Tom Clayton. This is Talk uh, TV. We're broadcasting live from the Talk Radio studio.